Welcome uh, this morning, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce Jerry Kaplan, who is the author of Humans uh, Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And a quick background of Jerry, he is a widely recognized uh, expert in the computer industry as a serial entrepreneur, technical innovator, and a best-selling author. He's currently a fellow at the Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford University and teaches ethics and impact artificial intelligence in the computer science department. So without further ado, here is Jerry Kaplan. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, now my job is to stall until we get a cable for this thing. So I'll try to uh, keep everybody entertained. This is my first slide, it's blue. Well, good morning, Berkeley. I didn't know people got up this early around here. Now the problem is, I need a cable guy, right? The cable guy doesn't get up until 11, so we'll see what happens. Uh, problem is, this talk is going to blow your mind. And it's really not designed for 10 o'clock in the morning. This is like having a T-bone steak for breakfast. So I hope you're ready to really dig in with some... Yes? Absolutely not. No, it's raw meat, raw meat all the way. I have four vegetarians and one vegan in my house. And I'm like, can we please have some bacon? Just a little bit of bacon. And so if I take a piece of bacon and I wave it over the food, you know, it's like, oh, I can't touch that. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. So let me get a sense so I can talk to you about things that you might like to hear. Um, how many people here are college graduates or above? That's wonderful. Okay. How many of you have degrees in science or technology? Excellent. Okay. The rest of you can leave. <laughs> um, any in computer science? Okay. Good. And have, how many of you have heard the term artificial intelligence? Everybody. Oh, that's an idea. I didn't know anybody had read my book. <laughs> you've read the book? I don't remember a thing. <laughs> Neither do I. You think you've got it bad. I write, you write them about 18 months before they appear in print. You know, so I'm talking about how terrible the job market is. <laughs> Here we are. I said, it'll be full employment by the time you guys get the book out. And it was. It's terrible. So one, anybody else? No? Somebody else raised their hand. Nobody read the book. Okay. Well, that's okay. You don't need to read the book, because I'm going to tell you everything everything that's valuable in it. Actually, it's full of interesting anecdotes if you like to hear about the Silicon Valley and all the people that I've crossed paths with or crossed swords with over the years. That's, that's often more fun than this boring AI stuff. But what I want to try to persuade you of today is that just about everything that you probably think about artificial intelligence is, is not correct. And it's actually something very different than what people think it is. And if I had my slides, I could demonstrate this. I've got some movies for you and things. But uh, let me go uh, consult my notes. So th the thing is that the common wisdom about artificial intelligence you know, is that we're building increasingly intelligent machines that are uh, ultimately going to surpass human capabilities, they're going to steal our jobs, and they're possibly even going to escape human control and they're going to take over the world. That's the public image of the field. But I want to present the case to you today that that's completely misguided, and uh, it's really counterproductive to look at it that way. In fact, the truth is much more boring. Anybody here doing work in AI? Uh-oh. Where, where do you work? Netflix. I'm going to, I think I may talk about them in the talk, yeah? Combat robots, yes, those are very popular in Berkeley. Yes. <laughs> Can I get one for my house? The, no, that's fine. Yeah, well, uh, I have a lot to say on that subject, but it's not the subject of this talk. Not the subject of this talk. Um, I think a better way to look at the field, better framing, is to think of it as a, a natural expansion of longstanding efforts to automate tasks. 
And this dates back at least to the start of the Industrial Revolution. So I want to start with the question of, can machines think? What is artificial intelligence really? Can a machine really think? Now, I will tell you guys that after a lifetime of work in this field, my reluctant and disappointing answer is no. Uh, at least I agree with uh, Alan Turing. You guys may be familiar with him. His conclusion in his 1950s paper on the, where he originally proposed the Turing test, if you actually read the paper as opposed to go watch the movies, um, he, he said, uh, I believe the question, can machines think, to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. That's what Alan Turing actually thought. Um, now, at best, they don't think the way people think, and it's really little more than an analogy to say that they, they think at all. You know, machines are not people, and there's just no persuasive evidence that they're on the path to becoming generally intelligent, sentient beings, despite what you guys see in the movies. That's not to say we can't have a robot that can kill people, but it's not what people think it means. Now, you might say, wait a minute. Can't uh, these machines solve all kinds of complex reasoning and perception problems? And the answer is sure. You know, they can perform tasks that humans solve using their natural intelligence. But that doesn't mean that the machines are intelligent. It merely means that many tasks that we thought required general intelligence are in fact subject to solution by other more mechanical means. Now, there's an old joke in AI, which is that once an AI problem is solved, it's no longer part of artificial intelligence. I no longer think that's uh, much of a joke. So I want to take another look at some of the signature accomplishments of artificial intelligence from this different perspective that I'm going to present to you today. Now, for decades, some of you, judging from the color of the hair, many of you who were around long enough to remember this, God knows I am. The archetypal test of the coming of age of artificial intelligence used to be when a machine could beat the world's chess champion. You know, for a very long time, chess was considered the quintessential demonstration of human intelligence. Surely, when a computer was the world chess champion, artificial intelligence had arrived. Well, it happened in 1997, when IBM's uh, program called Deep Blue beat the world's champion, Gary Kasparov. And there was lots of ink spilled in the media. Back then, they actually used ink. Uh, there was lamenting the arrival of super-intelligent machines. And there was hand-wringing over what this meant for the future of mankind. But the truth is, it meant nothing other than that you could use the increasing speed of computers uh, to play chess. The techniques have application to other similar classes of problems, but they hardly proved to be the uh, harbingers of the robot apocalypse that everybody was expecting. So then people said, sure, okay, okay, computers can play chess, but that's a limited, well-defined domain. They'll never be able to drive a car. That required a broad understanding of the real world. Uh, the ability to make split-second judgments in chaotic circumstances, and it requires common sense. That's what people thought. Well, as you know, this bulwark of human supremacy... Uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was breached in 2004 when, uh, for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's uh, grand challenge um, for autonomous vehicles. They proved that you could, in fact, build a car that can, could drive. Now, but this, this is the thing, those systems, and I know a lot of the people that built this thing, they drive cars. They don't build houses, they don't cook meals, they don't make beds. Those are all completely different problems. So we speak of autonomous vehicles, maybe you've heard that term, but what that means to an engineer and what it means to the general public are two very different things. The public discourse is dangerously disconnected uh, from the academic discourse in the field. To an engineer, it means that data from sensors can be synthesized and analyzed to formulate control instructions that are sent to effectors that drive the car, like the brakes and the steering. But to the general public, 
Uh, it means that the car is looking around. It's figuring out what it's seeing, and then it's deciding what to do next. Well, those two descriptions are fundamentally different. And a friend of mine, Brad Templeton, who's at Singularity University, he once said, your car will be truly autonomous when you instruct it to take you to the office, and instead it decides to go to the beach. <laughs> okay, so computers can play chess and they can drive cars, but they could never play Jeopardy. That requires too much world knowledge and understanding metaphors and clever wordplay. Well, thanks to the ingenious people at IBM, this hurdle has also been cleared. As you probably know, IBM's Watson system beat Ken Jennings, who was the world uh, champion in 2011. Now, what is Watson? The reality is it's a collection of facts and figures encoded into a cleverly organized modules that can quickly uh, and accurately answer various types of common Jeopardy questions. Now, Watson's main advantage, you may not know, and this was part of the magic show, was the main advantage it had over the human contestants was that it could ring in uh, more quickly than they could when it had a, an answer that it estimated a high likelihood was uh, correct. You know, it's a remarkable and very sophisticated knowledge-based retrieval system, an inference system, that was honed at that particular time to a very particular problem set. Okay, so. Maybe Watson isn't the holy grail. What about machine learning we read about so much today? Aren't they more like human intelligence, these systems? The answer is not really. In reality, the use of these anthropomorphic terms like deep learning, which you may have heard, or neural networks, which you may have heard, it's little more than an analogy. In the same sense that, you know, airplane wings, the design was inspired by birds. That's about what we're talking about here. Consider how machines and people learn. You can teach a computer to recognize cats by showing it a million images of cats, more than you will ever see in your lifetime. Uh, or you can just point one out to a three-year-old to get the same job done. That's a cat. <laughs> and now they know what a cat is. Obviously, humans and machines do not learn the same way. Let's look at another contemporary example, automatic translation. Now, tremendous strides have been made in this field in the past few years, mainly by applying statistical and machine learning techniques to large bodies of what are called concorded texts. But how do people perform this difficult task? They learn two or more languages, along with their respective cultures and the conventions of the language. Then they read some text in one language, they understand what it says, and they uh, render its meaning as closely as possible in the other language. Now, machine translation, as successful as it is today, bears almost no relationship to the human translation process. Its success simply means that there's another way to approximate the same results mechanically. Well, now we carry around smartphones. How many people have their phone with them today? There you go. Okay. Now, these are reminiscent of the capabilities of the uh, computer on the Star Trek Enterprise. Anybody old enough to remember Star Trek? I, dis I discovered at Stanford in my class, you know, it's like on Star Trek. They're like, what? <laughs> I have to get all new examples, you know, for, the, for this stuff. The worst part is none of them had seen uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's a, which is an absolute classic, but it's true. I had to explain what it was. I said, Go see the movie. Um, okay, you know, hey Siri, you know, you can you can talk to your phone and it talks back. Uh, it also becomes more capable every day as you download new applications and you upgrade the operating system. But do you really think of your phone as getting smarter in the human sense when you download a new application, or you enable voice recognition? You know, certainly not in the same sense that you get smarter when you uh, learn calculus or learn philosophy. It's a completely different thing. The truth is, a smartphone is the electronic equivalent of a Swiss army knife. It's a bunch of different information processing tools that are bound together into a single unit, and it takes advantage of certain commonalities like 
detailed maps or internet access, but it's a collection of tools. You have one integrated mind, and your phone has no mind at all. There's no one home. Okay, so I'm going to take a moment for a side rant on how common uh, misperceptions of AI are driven by the entertainment media and aided and abetted by uh, hype in the regular media. Thomas? Yeah, I got Thomas. Uh, and supported by AI. I love insulting my audience. I do this. On, any of you guys seen Lou Black? You know, I'm, I'm the Lou Black of academia. What do they mean talking about artificial intelligence? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to pick on IBM's Watson, but there are many, many other examples. Uh, more than you might think, Watson's Jeopardy victory was something of a magic show. And in my opinion, there's way too much of this sort of uh, gratuitous anthropomorphism in artificial intelligence. Few people realize that most Jeopardy contestants know the answers to all the questions. And the difference between winning and losing is how quickly you can ring in. And Watson, being a computer system, is way quicker on the trigger than those puny humans. Now, uh, IBM, in my view, didn't do the field any favors by wrapping Watson in a, in a theatrical suite of anthropomorphic features. This was just playing to the uh, cheap seats. There's really no technical reason to have the system say its responses, you know, in a calm, didactic tone of voice, you know. Okay, Alex, North Dakota. Um, and, uh, you know, they put up this headlight graphic of, you know, swirling lights suggesting that the machine had a mind and that it was thinking about the problem. These are incidental adornments to what otherwise was really a tremendous technical achievement. But to the public watching TV without a deep understanding of how the systems work, and with humans as the only uh, available exemplars with which to interpret uh, the results, the temptation for the average person to view this as human-like was irresistible. But these systems aren't. Robots don't have independent goals and desires. The robots aren't taking over our businesses. They aren't marrying our children. They don't watch the sci-fi channel at home when you're not around. <laughs> A robot that's designed to wash and fold laundry, this one was in Berkeley, by the way. Lots of dirty laundry in Berkeley. Uh, it it it's, can be plenty sophisticated. It might learn not to put the laundry away while you're sleeping, or determine uh, just how you like your shirts folded. But it isn't going to wake up one day and say, oh my god, what a fool I've been. I really want to play the great concert halls of Vienna. <laughs> now, with all the hoopla about intelligent robots, and the way the subject is portrayed in the movies, it's, you know, it's a little surprised that most people think this kind of thing is just around the corner. Let's see if this will work. Okay, that'll wake you up. I use this in like uh, Korea, and I'm going to China, and I'm a little worried about how they're going to interpret this there. That's a threat. Uh, now, all that's really thrilling, but let me show you the current state of the art. Now, the following robots are contestants in the latest Defense, and Research, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency Robotics Challenge. <laughs>
I'm about to really piss off this gentleman in the, in the audience, but the idea of a robotic soldier, like what you see in the movies, frankly, it makes me laugh. AI on the battlefield isn't likely to look anything like what you're seeing here. For starters, if you were designing one of these, wouldn't you put eyes all the way around the head so, it, so you can't sneak up on it from behind and hit it with a baseball bat? Uh, you know, if I was designing robotic soldiers, I wouldn't make them look menacing. I would make them look like cute little school children to throw the enemy off. Now, in the case of the DARPA challenge, the reason that the robots are shaped like humans is precisely because the challenge here was to get them to operate equipment that was designed to be operated by humans. You know, to drive a vehicle, use a power tool, open doors like you saw. But if your goal is to make a killing machine, uh, no sensible engineer is going to start with a design like this. So, we can build machines that are shaped like humans. We can program them to say, ouch, you know, when we pinch them. Uh, we can make them look sexy. And we can get them to tell us that they love us. But this is just a more sophisticated version of those mechanical robots they use, at, uh, sorry, mechanical rabbits that they use at racetracks, you know, to get the greyhounds to run. The difference, of course, is that we're the dogs that someone is trying to fool for their own profit and their own entertainment. So let's take a closer look at so-called machine intelligence. It's true that machines perform an increasingly diverse array of tasks that people perform by applying their native intelligence. But does that mean the machines are smart? Let's look at how we might measure supposed machine intelligence. Now, I just pulled this image off the internet. I didn't make this slide. I, my slides are hopefully not this ugly. Um, let's look at the question though, of how we can, we can start by looking at how we measure human intelligence. A common method is with IQ tests. But even for humans, this is a deeply flawed concept. You know, we love to measure and rank things with numbers. But let's face it, reducing human intelligence to some kind of flat linear scale is highly questionable. You know, little Sally, do I have her here? Little Sally did uh, two more arithmetic problems than Johnny did in the time allotted. So uh, her IQ is seven points higher than his. I mean, that's bull. You know, figure out a fairer way to get that last slot in kindergarten here in Berkeley. But this is not to say that some people aren't smarter than others, uh, only that a simple linear numerical measure provides an inappropriate patina of objectivity and uh, precision. But the story gets worse. Any psychologists here? My psych people? She's really reluctant. Like, oh, he's going to call on me. I promise not to embarrass you any more than I've already done. Um, what psychologists actually say, you can stand up and go, no, we don't, uh, is that IQ doesn't measure intelligence at all. It's simply what they call developmental competence. And that's why your IQ is calculated as a function of your age. You know, behind, after, beyond childhood, it's basically meaningless. You know, as psychologists are fond of pointing out, there are many different kinds of intelligence, social, emotional, analytic, analytic athletic, musical, they're all different. So what does it mean to say here that, uh, whoops, that, whoops, that, you know, Mozart and Einstein had the same IQ? I don't think that means anything. Uh, now, suppose we, uh, it, more to the point, am I going backwards? More to the point, it's even less meaningful to talk about machines having an IQ. Suppose we give the same IQ test to a machine that we administer to humans. Wow, it only took one millisecond to accurately complete the same sums that took Sally on that, on that slide and Johnny an hour. The machine must be super smart. Of course, that's nonsense. Now, as you might know, here's an interesting historical example. Calculating used to be the province of highly trained specialists and uh, they were known as calculators. When you said, get me a calculator, it used to mean bring me a, a person who can do calculations. You know, the profession was highly respected. It required considerable intelligence. By the way, this is in the Middle Ages. This was like 19, 1940. Uh, well, that is the Middle Ages to some people. 
Um, it required considerable intelligence, attention to detail, and great human skill. And now this function is performed by tools that are so inexpensive we give them away at trade shows as trinkets. Okay. You're probably wondering how I'm going to tie this slide into my talk. The truth is that intelligence isn't an objective, well-defined, measurable attribute like mass or like blood pressure. It's a subjective, culturally influenced concept that's more like beauty. Who's more attractive? Jelena Jolie <laughs> or January Joan? <laughs> Is, it, is the answer the same in Nairobi or in Karachi? Can you say that one is 6.5% more attractive than the other? Uh, now, some of you, how many people here have heard the term superintelligence? Okay, good. The rest of you can go to sleep for a minute. It was popularized, uh, recently popularized in a book by Nick Bostrom. Great guy, bad idea. Uh, he's a uh, philosopher at uh, Oxford University. And uh, let me apply my observation about beauty to superintelligence. Basically, his idea is that machines are getting more and more intelligent, and they're going to get more intelligent than we are and take over the world, and that that's a danger. As anybody can see from the movies, female robots are getting more and more attractive. And they're more capable all the time. You know, if I were to subscribe to such a concept, I could write a scholarly tome, his was 400 pages, uh, about how robots are becoming more beautiful. Maybe I'd call it like uh, super attractiveness or something. You know, I could conclude that this is an existential threat to humanity because when female robots begin to exceed human attractiveness, men are only going to desire to mate with them and that's going to disrupt our natural reproductive process. Well, here's a news flash. There's no such thing as a female robot or a male robot, despite what you the average moviegoer is encouraged to believe. You know, just like there's no such thing as a generally intelligent robot. This is a comparable piece, slice of uh, fiction. We might want to create such a thing, but a sober look at the results so far don't suggest that we're on a path toward that. You know, it's like climbing a tree and claiming you're making progress toward getting to the moon. Now, are the robots really taking over? Well, by the superintelligence logic, the machines took over a long time ago, whether they're smart or they're not. You know, they move our freight, they score our tests, they explore the cosmos, they handle our billing, they plant and pick most of our crops, they trade stocks, they store and retrieve our documents, and they manufacture just about everything, including themselves. Now, all those are tasks that not that long ago would be regarded as requiring human effort and human intelligence. Oh my God, the robots can outperform us. Is that a threat? Of course not. It's the whole point of automation. Factories are automated because machines can do the job of skilled workers better and cheaper. You know, we use computers to store and organize information because this is far better than relying on file clerks and uh, paper documents. You know, ATMs are faster and more accurate than, than bank tellers. Uh, Painting natural-looking hair, do I have a slide on this? No. Uh, painting natural-looking hair used to be a skill honed through years of practice and apprenticeship by the most talented artists alive. Yet today, nobody blinks when Disney uses CGI rendering techniques to animate Rapunzel's flowing hair. By the way, I gave a version of this talk at South by Southwest, if you guys are familiar with that conference. And a guy came up to me after, he says, I can't believe you used that example. I'm the guy who animated Rapunzel's hair. <laughs> I, was, I thought that was really cool. So if we can program machines to read x-rays or to write simple news stories, no offense, <laughs> to drive delivery trucks, even to draft certain kinds of contracts, all the better. I say good riddance to those things. Go get another job. So what's wrong with the traditional picture of AI? We can build machines and write programs that perform tasks that previously required human intelligence and attention, but there's really no, nothing new about that. Advances in AI are better understood as progress 
in automation, not as some kind of recreation of human intelligence. You know, we can program machines to solve very complex problems, and we can get them to operate with increasing independence, but to call this a simulated form of human intelligence is really little more than a fantasy. So my point is simple, lots of problems that we think require intelligence to solve actually don't. There are other ways to solve them, and that's what we're using the machines to do. Okay, now let me get to the stuff that is likely to play better to a Berkeley audience. Uh, I've given you a new way to think about artificial intelligence, and I want to talk about the implications of that perspective. We're worrying about the wrong things right now in society. Uh, it's certainly true that AI is going to have a serious impact on labor markets and employment, but perhaps not the way that people expect. You know, if you think of machines as becoming ever more intelligent and threatening our livelihoods, the obvious solution is to prevent them from getting smarter. And there are people trying to do that, having meetings to talk about this. You know, we can lock our doors and we can arm ourselves with uh, tasers, because I must work on robots, right? Uh, well, you uh, review these. Uh, these are not real headlines. Some, some people thought they were. New York Times, robots steal jobs at record pace. And the Wall Street Journal, profits rise as worker productivity soars. Same thing. Well, the robots are coming, but not exactly for our jobs. Because machines and computers don't perform jobs, they automate tasks. And except in extreme cases, you don't just roll in a robot and show an employee to the door. Instead, the new technology hollows out and changes the jobs that people perform. You know, even experts spend uh, most of their time doing mundane, repetitive tasks, like reviewing lab test results, or drafting simple contracts, or writing very straightforward press releases, or you fill out paperwork and forms. You know, on the blue-collar side, We've got lots of workers who lay bricks, paint houses, mow lawns, drive cars, load trucks, pack boxes, take blood samples, fight fires, deliver mail, direct traffic, and so on. And many of these intellectual and physical tasks uh, require straightforward logic or simple hand-eye coordination. And the new technologies that are currently being developed in AI uh, are poised to automate a great many of those kinds of tasks. So if your job involves a narrow and well-defined set of duties, and many of them do, then indeed your employment is at risk. But if you have a broader set of responsibilities, or if your job requires a human touch, such as expressing sympathy or providing companionship, I don't think you have much to worry about. Uh, check out this comparison of light licensed practical nurse duties, and uh, bricklayer duties. I got this right off the, some government website. Um, now, who do you think's job is more at risk from automation? Nurses have nothing to worry about. Uh, look at a few of these. Ensuring patients and their families understand release instructions. Good luck building a machine to do that. Providing emotional support. Who wants that from a machine? So, we're not really, nurses are not at risk. On the other hand, a bricklayer lays bricks, and we can build machines that will lay bricks, and we will not need bricklayers. Same thing, we will not need drivers for trucks. It's just that simple, for the same reasons. Okay, uh, so the other thing to recognize is that one person's productivity-enhancing tool is somebody else's pink slip. Uh, it, or more likely, it's a job that, that uh, no longer needs, needs to be filled. So there's this constant thing you see, like, well, we're not putting people out of work. You should read the IBM press releases. We're, we're making people more productive. Duh, that's putting people out of work. It's the same thing. Okay, now automation, whether it's uh, driven by AI or not, also changes the skills necessary to perform the work, and that's the key point. You know, if an oncologist no longer needs to read MRIs, or an accountant can operate a computer program instead of doing calculations by hand, you have different aptitudes and different talents and different training may be required. And the resulting loss of jobs is what economists call structural uh, or technological unemployment. It's the mismatch of the skills in the labor force against the needs of employers. So the more pressing problem 
posed by AI for workers is not so much the lack of jobs, but the way the technology transforms the nature of the work and therefore the training that's required to uh, get the job done. Now, it's the good news. Historically, as automation has eliminated that need for workers, uh, the resulting increase in wealth eventually generated new kinds of jobs to take up the slack. And I see no reason why this pattern is not going to continue. But the key word here is eventually. It doesn't happen right away. Let me give you a wild example most people are not aware of. Talk about farm employment. 200 years ago, more than 90% of the U.S. population worked in agriculture. Basically, all any, anybody did was to grow food. You know, the, the stuff that you see on Downton Abbey, you know, and all those shows? That was a tiny little sliver of the population. Everybody else was out there growing food. Now, today, less than 2% of the population is required to feed everybody. Oh, my God, is everybody out of work? Of course not. We've had plenty of time to adapt. And as our standard of living has relentlessly increased, which I'm going to get to in a minute, new opportunities have always arisen for people to fill the ever-expanding expectations of our ever-richer society. Now, try to imagine this. If you took the average person from 1800 and they could see us today, they would think we all went nuts. You know, why not buy, work a few hours a week at McDonald's, uh, buy a sack of potatoes and a jug of wine, dig, build a shack in the woods, dig a hole for an outhouse, and uh, live a life of leisure? You know, but somehow our expectations, rising expectations, seem to magically have uh, kept pace with our wealth. So you might ask, well, what are the jobs of tomorrow? There'll be plenty of them. Mostly, there'll be those that inherently involve some kind of personal touch, or a demonstration of skill, or some kind of person-to-person -person interaction. You know, there's no reason we can't be a society of competitive gamers, of artisans, Anybody here post stuff on Etsy, sell on Etsy? Nobody? In a, a one? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, that's the future. Uh, we can be personal shoppers. We can be flower arrangers. We can be tennis pros. We can be party planners. And no doubt a lot of other things that don't exist yet. You know, nobody wants to go to a robotic undertaker who stands up and says, I am so sorry for your loss. It's not going to happen. So you might think, well, who's going to do all the real work? Well, our great-grandchildren may think our idea of real work is very 21st century. You know, it may only take 2% of the population, assisted by some pretty remarkable automation, to accomplish what takes 90% of our labor today. So what? You know, it may be as important to people a century from now, the average person, to have fresh flowers in the house every day, uh, as it is to us to uh, shower every day. By the way, only 70% only of the people in the U.S. take a shower every day. <laughs> well, in 1900, the average was about once a week. Just to show you how these things change. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands. <laughs> oh, I crack me up. That's terrible. My wife hates this. You think you're so smart. Uh, two of my kids just got their first jobs, uh, it's true, and I, I couldn't help but notice that the professions that they chose didn't even exist 10 years ago. Uh, one of them does social media promotion uh, for uh, uh, a, a, one of the Clorox brands of salad dressing, actually, over here in Oakland, and uh, the other works in an online education company. That didn't exist 10 years ago. So that's the good news, but the bad news is it takes some time for these transitions to happen. And as a new wave of AI-enabled applications come into being, they're likely to accelerate this normal cycle of job destruction and creation. So we need to find new ways to retrain displaced workers. Now, in my book, this is a book fair, so I can talk about my book, I have a, uh, I, I propose a couple of ideas. Uh, these are not that they're perfect or they're right. It's just to show the kind of thinking we can do. One of them is the idea of a job mortgage. Basically, that people should be able to learn new skills by borrowing against their future earnings potential. 
Now, I'm not the first guy to come up with this. It goes all the way back to uh, certainly Milton Friedman. Um, you know, today in the U.S., vocational training is really messed up. And that, I'm sorry to say, I'm not a libertarian, but it's mainly because the government is the lender of first resort for student loans. So the skills that people learn are disconnected from the needs of the marketplace. You can get a loan to study anything. And I've known plenty of people who went, how many went to law school here? One, okay. It's very hard for a lawyer, to, you employed? You are employed, good, okay. Very hard today for, it's a crisis in the legal industry because the cost of a legal education typically is, today does not pay back, unless you're really good, which I'm sure you are. You can defend me after this is over. Um, so what's going on is we're not, we're not investing in education. We're handing out money to people to learn things that won't help them pay it back. You know, if you can't get a job, it's too bad. Your student loan is still due. That whole student loan crisis wouldn't be a problem if they were teaching the skills that allowed people to make the income to pay it back. And then we do stupid things like they get mad because people declare bankruptcy. You guys may know of this. And they made it difficult or impossible for students to do that. So they're on the hook for the rest of their lives. It's disgusting. You know, we need to create new financial instruments that tie the uh, deployment of the capital to the return on the investment. And that's exactly what we do with home mortgages and uh, loans that we make to businesses. You know, there are ways we can use the discipline of the marketplace to help us productively repurpose uh, displaced workers. And that doesn't just benefit them, it benefits all of society. Now finally, there's another dark cloud uh, related to advances in AI that I want to talk about. While it's true that automation makes society richer, there are serious questions about whose pockets are filled by this increased wealth. Now we in high tech uh, tend to believe that uh, we're developing dazzling technologies for a needy and grateful world. And indeed, we've made tremendous progress on raising the standard of living for the very poorest of the poor worldwide. Uh, but for the developed world, like here, the news is not so good. Up until about 1970, on and off, excuse me, we found ways to distribute at least some of the economic benefits broadly across society. Uh, and that supported the rise of the so-called mythical middle class. But it doesn't take much to see that those days are over. As economists know, automation is the substitution of capital for labor. And Karl Marx, I'm here to tell you, was right. The struggle between capital and labor is a losing proposition for the workers. And what that means is that the benefits of automation naturally accrue to those who can invest in the new systems. Now, why not? People aren't working harder. Uh, they aren't smarter than they used to be. In fact, working hours have actually decreased uh, slowly but consistently for at least the past 100 years. The reason we can do more with less now is that business owners invest some of their capital, their profits, into process and productivity improvements. And of course, they're going to reap the rewards. So what has all this got to do with AI? Can't really make out that slide. Ignore it. Uh, the technologies on the drawing boards in the uh, labs that I deal with uh, are quickening the hearts of entrepreneurs and investors everywhere. And they are the ones who stand to benefit, while they export more and more of the risks to the rest of society. Workers are less secure, wages stagnate, pension funds go bust. You know, we're raising a generation of contractors for the gig economy, whose variable working hours and their health benefits are their own problem. But the truth is, some people have the mistaken impression that the free market will address these problems. Anybody here willing to admit to being a Republican? Not a person in the crowd. Okay. <laughs> that, that won't work. If only we can get the government out of the way. Well, I'm here to tell you that our economy is hardly an example of unfettered capitalism. The fact is there's all sorts of rules and policies that drive where the capital goes, how it's deplored, deployed, and who gets the returns. And I'm speaking from first-hand experience. 
The problem is that our economic and regulatory policies have become decoupled from our social goals, and we have to fix that. But how do we do that? The good news is that our economy is not static. It doubles about every 40 years. People don't realize how, much, how quickly we're actually becoming wealthier. Uh, it's done that remarkably reliably since the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1700. Now, in 1800, the average household income in the United States, anybody want to take a real quick a guess what the average household income in the United States was? $500. You're very close. It was $1,000. That was the average household income in 1800. Uh, that, by the way, that's an inflation-adjusted figure. I mean, this isn't like, you know, old money versus new money. It was really $1,000. Um, that's about the same as it is in Malawi and Mozambique today. And uh, it's probably not coincidental that their economies look surprisingly similar to what the economy looked like, the structure of the economy in the U.S. 200 years ago. But I doubt that people in Ben Franklin's time thought of themselves as dirt poor. Uh, they were barely scratching out an existence. So what this means is that 40 years from now, most likely there will literally be twice as much wealth to go around as there is today. So the challenge for us is to implement policies that are going to encourage that wealth to be more broadly uh, distributed. You know, we don't have to steal from the rich and give to the poor. You know, we need to provide incentives for entrepreneurs and businesses to find better ways to benefit ever wider swaths of society, and that's a policy set of issues. Now, in my book, among my other bad ideas, uh, just an example of an idea, is uh, a tax idea. I suggest that we make corporate taxes progressive based on how broadly distributed a uh, company's equity is. So what that means is that the more stockholders a company has, the suitably defined, and I do go into this in the book in some detail, um, the lower the tax rate would be because they're benefiting more people. So Microsoft, believe it or not, is one of the most widely distributed stocks, and they should pay a lower tax rate, in my opinion, than Bechtel. Anybody know Bechtel? A couple of you do? Okay. That's privately held. It's hold, held by a family. They should pay a higher tax rate. So what will happen as a result is that the companies will find ways to distribute their benefits more broadly, and they have an advantage in the marketplace. Now, progressive policies like this can promote our social goals without stifling economic growth. You know, we just have to get on with it and uh, stop believing the myth that unfettered capitalism is the answer to the world's problems. So let me wrap up. I don't want you to think that I'm anti-AI. Nothing is further from the truth. I think its potential impact on the world is similar, and I'm not exaggerating, to the invention of the wheel. But we need to think of it not as some sort of magical discontinuity in the development of intelligent life on Earth, but as a powerful collection of automation tools with the potential to transform our livelihoods and to vastly increase our wealth. The challenge that we face is that our existing institutions, without some uh, enlightened rethinking, run a serious risk of making a mess out of this opportunity. You know, I'm supremely confident that our future is very bright, that it's much more Star Trek than it is Terminator. But this transition to the future may be protracted and brutal unless we pay attention to the, the issues that I've raised here for you today. You know, we have to find new and better ways to ensure that our economy doesn't just motor on, going faster and faster, while throwing more and more people overboard. You know, our technology and our economy should serve us, not the other way around. So thank you very much. And Thomas will come up. Test. So. Okay, this is a quick round of applause for Jerry. Thank you. So I, I realized that I had to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Thomas Lee, business columnist with the San Francisco Chronicle. And the reason why I want to introduce myself is also because, first question, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but 
will robots steal my job as a journalist? Uh, the answer is no. Good. Uh, now we can all go home now. So. Okay. Well, as, as you probably are aware, there's a lot of hoopla. This is a great example of how this stuff is overpromised. Mm -hmm. There's uh, programs that are pretty good from places like Narrative Science, is the name of one company that does this, that can take uh, press releases or structured data that's been put out by different organizations, and it can structure it into a reasonably well-written press release, like for uh, sporting events. Yeah. And um, that's fine, but it's pretty routine. They can't... These programs don't have anything like the kind of insightful analysis that you do, and I mean that seriously. Uh, and they can't write the kinds of articles that you write. They can't go around and interview people and do things. But I don't know about your career I, in detail, but um, you know, did you start out having to write those, you know, you know, the, 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 the such and such team you know, scored 20 points in the second half? You, know, you may go through a training period where you have to do that stuff. Just like lawyers have to go through uh, doing dis uh, discovery work and other boring tasks. And we're going to eliminate those tasks, so they won't need to do that anymore. It's the best way to think about the difference between artificial intelligence and humans. Is it about judgment, that humans have the capacity to make judgment as opposed to AI, or is that the wrong way of looking at it? Uh, I, I, honestly, I think that is the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> uh, machines are, because of the way we program them, are capable of I'll, I'll just, I don't want to anthropomorphize them, but they, they can mimic the judgments that, that we make. There's no question about it. So you can actually automate judgment then? Though. Well, judgment is it's the same kind of thing. What does yeah. judgment mean? Right. Um, you know, it's the ability to make a choice between A and B based upon some kind of input. Absolutely, we can do that. You know, is your car making a judgment that it's going out of the lane? You know, I drove here in my car. It has a lane-keeping function. Uh, it's not making a judgment, it's taking in data and, and giving me some information. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe that as a judgment. It's just we're anthropomorphizing this mm -hmm. in a way that is inappropriate for the use of technology. Technology can be used to solve lots of complex problems that normally require human intelligence and judgment. So you devoted uh, the kind of first part of your presentation about, like you're just saying, the kind of wrong ways we kind of look at it, right? And most of the way uh, the, the the debate is framed, or the fear is framed that are robots or AI going to be superior to humans? Are they going to be more humans than humans are? But there's been a recent debate about how we should look at human the human brain. I know you're not a neurologist, but there's a debate on whether or not we should even look at humans as uh, with the human brain. Is a human brain a computer? Is a human brain a machine? Do they share some sort of attributes? Is, is that a useful debate to even have, whether humans are becoming more like machines? Well, it's a fun debate to have. Is it useful? I don't think so. If you go back and you look at the history of people developing new technologies, they always talked about its relationship to the human brain. If you can go back to when the telephone network was first put together, say, well, it operates like the human brain. There are connections and you know, electronic things floating around. But the truth is, we do not have a, any coherent theory of human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so without that, all we're doing is blowing smoke. We're just saying, well, sort of like that, and you know, we call it you know, neural networks, but nobody understands. We have very little understanding of how the brain works. We don't understand how consciousness arises. We don't understand what, whether there is or is not free will, a subject that I, I read about in my book. Um, and maybe we're machines, just really complex machines, but we don't know. And it certainly doesn't match our intuition about the way in which mechanical objects and programs can uh, perform work and do things and the way that our brain operates. So should we actually be paying more attention or at least do more research or understand about how the human brain works before we even get into more uh, advanced artificial intelligence capabilities? Or? Well, that's a very good question. I think the real answer is that we should use whatever, whatever helps us, it's like whatever gets you through the night. You know, whatever helps us to increase the level of automation, and that will increase our wealth, and you know, through, that's great. You know, if, if the guy who designed the airplane wing uh, took his inspiration from birds, that's great. But to, you know, I don't think anybody criticizing, well, it, it's not really flying because uh, it doesn't make a, a nest in trees, and you know, it doesn't regurgitate jet fuel to feed its young. Right. Okay, so you've got to take the parts you want, take inspiration from nature, absolutely. And maybe someday, this is way beyond my lifetime, maybe not yours, uh, 
you know, there may be some way of looking into the brain and saying, okay, you know, there's a, there's a correlation, there's a relationship here between how these, these things work. And I'm sure there is, but I know there is, between the way that airplanes' wings work and, and birds fly. Obviously, there's a relationship. But, you know, you don't say, we, it's not going to be real until the airplanes flap their wings. It, it's just the wrong way to be thinking about the, these kinds of problems. Use it for inspiration. And most of the stuff that you hear, you know, if people are just implicitly over-promising or suggesting things that just aren't true. If you go over here to Berkeley and you talk to the people who are doing work in AI and you say, are you simulating a human? Are you making more intelligent machines? I do this at Stanford. The students are like, well, I don't know, not me. I hear about that stuff. So God must be the guy in the next office. They're just building something that'll recognize pictures of cats, you know? And, and they, you know, they, they're in the details. They know that it may or may not have anything to do with the way we do it. So there's a big disconnect between the actual workers and, you know, the, the, to me, the crazies who are out there promoting this idea that we're building intelligent machines. Well, let's talk about those crazies. I mean, you kind of alluded that part of our fear of artificial intelligence partly due to the media, partly due to pop culture, like movies like The Terminator or whatnot. But you got some really, really smart people who are already worrying, are worrying about the dangerous AI, such as Stephen Hawking, uh, Elon Musk, yes. uh, Bill Gates. Are, are, are they crazy? Um, no. Uh, let, me, let me be more accurate and precise rather than playing to my audience on this. Uh, these, are, these are very smart guys, and they're, they're very good guys. But they're not in this field. And they're reflecting the same thing that everybody else is. They've seen the movies, they talk to people, and they've got a couple of very vocal semi-academics, I would call them, promoting this point of view about intelligence. I picked on Nick Bostrom. He's a great guy. He's very smart. And he's done a lot of interesting work. Uh, but, um, you know, he, that's where they're getting their, 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 their ideas from. Now, Stephen Hawking is, of course, a, a great man and, and a uh, remarkable uh, astrophysicist, is that correct? Cosmologist. 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 Well, I won't argue with him about radiation from black holes. He shouldn't argue with me about what's going on in artificial intelligence. Do you think, th do you think guys like that do more kind of damage to uh, the perception of AI than any movie, or I mean? Yeah, because they lend credibility to these mistaken ideas. Uh, there's a giant echo chamber, and this, uh, the field of AI has a tremendous PR problem, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, I didn't include in my talk the recent win of, uh, on Go, the game, board game of Go, uh, that took place in Korea. That was just a few months ago. And people I know, friends of mine from Google, are out there in Korea going, this is an indication that we're making progress toward, this is an intelligent machine, and the technique, they call it Deep Mind is the name of the division. I mean, come on. And I've met those guys. They're dead serious. Uh, I won't name all the names. But, but you know, it, it, it has a benefit that implicitly for them being able to promote the mis mysterious and wonderful work that they're doing. And the real purpose of that, like the IBM, IBM didn't develop a, a program to play chess because of its tremendous economic benefits. As a, uh, this was 40 years ago. I, I had to teach an introductory course in computer science at the University of Pennsylvania. And we had a question, why do we teach computers, why do we program computers to play chess? And one of the students turned in a wonderful answer that's really stuck with me. He said, uh, we program computers to play chess to save us from the drudgery of having to do it ourselves. <laughs> so ask yourself the question, why did IBM invest so much money in winning at Jeopardy? It's to enhance the reputation of the company, to show how advanced their technology is. And if as a side effect, it creates this misimpression which leads us to not really deal with the real problems that come out of the development of this technology, that's not their, their problem. Uh, in fact, I'm maybe going east in a few weeks to talk with uh, people at IBM about, about this problem. But, um, you know, that's not their problem. So you really got to think about what are the motivations of these people. They're well-intentioned, but it... Well, it's actually interesting that you talk about IBM and Watson because I, 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 I talked to them, and I did some stories on them, mm -hmm. and uh, this might be a little bit of a side, but they're moving from you know, showing Watson and Jeopardy or, or Deep Blue playing chess as more of a novelty, you know, which is to show the 
the potential of artificial intelligence. But now, IBM Watson is really, especially in this uh, region, is making a huge, huge push to commercialize the technology. That's correct. And what's interesting about uh, Watson and Jeopardy is that, what, you were right, they give human characteristics to Watson. Watson's not even a single entity. Watson's a collection, collection of, of databases and software, so that's kind of an uh, interesting point. But, uh, but let's move to the, uh, the economics and labor. Uh, in your book, Right. Uh, I, I think most of your presentation, you're trying to lessen our fears about uh, AI, what it is or what it isn't. But you, in your book, you mentioned that we might be thinking that, oh, well, you know, I'm not doing an automated task. I'm not a, uh, a, in a working in the factory per se, right? But you say that it could really impact the professional services for like highly educated uh, white collar workers. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, sure. There's a because a side effect. The side effect of um, this mistaken view of the field that, that people have is, well, if they're getting more intelligent, probably they can only do jobs that, let's just say, less intelligent people can do today, and people who require a lot of, who have a great deal of skill and training and intelligence, that's going to be off in the future. But it's not the way you slice that. It's not the way it works. The answer is that just about everybody, a three-year-old can do lots of tasks that we have no clue how to build a machine to do. Uh, and similarly, I mean, I don't know, I'll pick, pick a doctor, because uh, that's usually a highly respected uh, uh, profession, not by me, but uh, by other people. Um, many of those tasks that a doctor does are automatable in the same, same way. So it slices, in, and there's certain characteristics that make a task automatable. It's probably not worth going into here. But um, it, it cuts across the whole spectrum from our, our best experts and highly trained experts to the simplest people who are, you know, putting a, a, a sprinkler system in the ground in your backyard, you know, and so there, we really need to stop thinking about jobs and start thinking about tasks. Because I get asked all the time, well, which professions are most at risk? There are some. Mm -hmm. I would not become a professional driver today. That's an easily automated, not easily, but an automatable task in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, but it, there are very certain characteristics, very specific characteristics that make that possible, and. Uh, it's not that like doctors are safe, because uh, half their work can be automated. Mm -hmm. I, I give you a lot of specific examples, but we only have a few minutes here. Yeah, can we have uh, questions? Please? Sure. Uh, yes, right in the middle there. Hello, test. So I was wondering about uh, uh, many, many years ago, there was like an AI winter when people really uh, hyped up about expert systems and so on. And are we seeing some of the similar things again where we're expecting a lot of things to happen, but reality is just going to be simplifying tasks and big ideas about you, AI may just fade away? Well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm old enough to have lived through at least two AI winters. Uh, and uh, we go through this cycle of hype and disappointment. I think we are, I have a big debate going with some of uh, uh, Thomas's colleagues on, on the subject of where we are in that cycle. But uh, unfortunately, the general consensus is we're on the leading edge of yet another one of these. Uh, you're going to hear machine learning and neural networks and deep learning and all this stuff. You're going to hear it everywhere. You know, and this job used to be done by humans, and now machines can do it. You're going to hear a lot of that over the next five years or so. But I think the truth is going to be somewhat disappointing, and it's not going to live up to those expectations and hype if history is a guide. And we'll go through another one of these things. Where, oh, AI, that didn't work. If you ask the people who are doing AI today in machine learning, they literally have done this, and you talk to them about uh, logical inference and theorem proving, which was a previous wave, which was supposed to be the basis of human intelligence, according to the people who did that, they'll say, oh, that stuff didn't work. And I mean, they're wrong, it did work, and we're actually using it in all kinds of ways. When you go uh, use a navigation system in your car, you know, that's not done through machine learning. It, it's done through a, a, a set of heuristic processes that decide what the best route is to take. And it's really interesting and really complicated. So, yeah, we're just adding new technologies to our tool bag. And uh, the latest one is very powerful and opens up a whole new set of tasks that we can do. The machine learning will open up a whole new set of tasks. But I don't think it's some kind of holy grail. I see no evidence for it. And uh, we'll probably go through a couple more cycles like this. Good question. Another question? That gentleman right there. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, this is a, 
I can give another hour talk on this. It's a really interesting area because as we cede, I'll call it control, of our decision making to machines, machines have to make what we would consider ethical decisions. Now, what's interesting about this is that machines don't have to be ethical. They just have to behave in ways that we find socially acceptable and ethical. And there are ways to, in, to incorporate that into the programming of the machines. Uh, the, we're going to see this right away in the, in the driverless cars, in the autonomous vehicles. You know, it, it can sense that there are five people in this corner and one person on that corner. It, it can't stop. It's got to do something. Should it kill you? which is an interesting question as the single passenger of the car. Should it turn left? Should it turn right? Well, that's an ethical decision. It, not that we can't do it by machine, but uh, we need to recognize this. The biggest risk, particularly as the, the people who are really working on this in the military, I'll give them real credit for this, they're not just going ahead with all this stuff without convening conferences full of uh, fuzzy-headed academics and you know, pundits and stuff, and they're really talking about this, and seriously, they do it really well. Uh, I know several of them, uh, uh, you know, they're really, they're really smart guys and they're really thinking about this. The big problem that occurs is there's a disconnection between the person making the decision and the actual, uh, the person taking the action and the, per and the device that's making a decision as to who to kill, let's say out in the field. So when you break this chain of responsibility, nobody's responsible for the fact that that automated gun just shot six children you know, who's, who's responsible? These are real questions. Uh, there's a theory, I'm not a proponent of it, but it's re reasonable that, um, I'm gonna put this, uh, that you shouldn't be making decisions as to who to kill unless you can feel remorse for your decision. So that's the kind of philosophical issues that people are concerned about. Uh, so it's, it's, there are many, many ethical issues that will be, arise right here, right now, and you'll experience them in the next 10 years about the use of this kind of technology. Jerry, I just want to jump on that for a quick second. Sure. If, in terms of ethics, if humans you know, make algorithms and they're the ones that make robots, artificial intelligence, can they imprint their own uh, biases or, or, or even like uh, negative attributes like racism into uh, the machines that govern our lives? So in other words, if we can automate tasks, can we automate, automate you know, things like racism and biases? And things like that? Absolutely, there's no question about it. It's entirely, you don't do it by saying, I'm gonna put my racist attitudes into the machine. <laughs> uh, but it, it obviously, just like in your profession, you naturally reflect your own personal views, even though you do your best to try to be even-handed and uh, uh, fair. Uh, you know, that's the way the, way the world works. Um, look, psycho machines are natural psychopaths, okay? They don't really have empathy, they don't really have understanding of, of uh, uh, other people. But Here's a weird fact. 2% of the US population are clinically psychopaths. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands. <laughs> but the truth is, psychopaths may not have the same emotional uh, makeup as the rest of us, but they suck it up and they get along. They understand that people aren't supposed to do certain kinds of things. And they are intelligent enough to act accordingly. In fact, psychopaths, on average, are much smarter than the average population. It's a weird fact. So machines are natural psychopaths, and we need to uh, develop algorithms that, uh, so we have civilized robots for a human world. Question. Uh, we probably ought to. I think we're, we're out of time. We're I think we're out of time. time. Can you just tell us where you're going to be with your book or other things? Sure. Can, can, some, can somebody tell me? I think I'm going to be out there. If anybody wants to buy a book, that's, it's a great doorstop. It, it doubles as a doorstop. Please come on out. I'll be happy to talk to you and uh, sign well, a book. And well, thank you, Thomas. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you found the uh, discussion uh, very helpful.